When I started the drawings for projection, I wasn't thinking of making an animated film. I was thinking of watching a drawing come into being. To film a drawing successively, to see the stages a drawing took while making it. And then when I'd finished making the drawing, I realized I could go on filming. I could go on adjusting the drawing, erasing, adding, and refilming, and that the drawing could take on a life of its own. So the, the films didn't begin the way a film usually begins, with, with a script, a theme, a storyboard. And none of the films have been made with a script or a storyboard. They always start with some film, some images in the middle. And then when I look at those images, other images are suggested around them, which may change their order as the film is edited. But the, the film at the end has a shape, but it's a shape that is found during the making of it. Um, they end up with a linear, the, the films end with a linear structure, but they don't start with one. They start with sets of associations, one image suggesting another. Because the films are slow to make, they take many months, and the months of making the films are essentially a walk between the drawings and the camera, backwards and forwards. And in that walk, there's a lot of time for rumination, for thinking of what images could lead to another. Each time I make a film, I hope I'm making a comedy, but in fact, they never turn into a comedy. I think because it's messy and charcoal and gray, it has an atmosphere of memory. It has an atmosphere of darkness around it from the use of the materials. So there's an important part of the theme which is given not by me, but by the medium itself. So I don't, it's not as if there's a grand theme that I want to express. It's always something I want to discover. So the hope is that at the end of the film, the end of the eight months of making a film, I will discover what the films are about. It's not as if I say, this is knowledge I have, which I want to give to an audience. It's saying, let me hope that while making the film, there'll be something that I'll come to understand myself. When you look at a drawing, a static drawing, a finished drawing, and you look at it for a minute, then it is a sense, it is your minute that you are giving to the drawing. Okay? You're aware of your time passing. If there is a movement in the film, even if it's very small, the movement of a bird across or the grass waving, suddenly the time gets taken by the film and you're observing someone else's time, the time of the film. So that's why very often there are these minimal and small movements in the film. I don't think that the f animals or the different things stand for something else. They're not there to be interpreted. So. But the, the cat, for example, there's a lot of drawings of the cat. The cat is there because of its possibility of transformation. The cat is a very simple thing to draw with rough charcoal marks and you can then adjust those marks and it turns into a telephone or into a press uh, or into any number of different other objects. So it's about transformation rather than a different kind of specific representation that doesn't represent purity or anger or any of those kinds of abstract categories. I think in, the, in some of the films I was doing, I was looking at some of the early pioneers of filmmaking who looked at all the different experiments with what happens to time if you run a film backwards. It becomes a way of examining time itself, film. But then there's also a kind of a set of metaphoric images or ideas that come from running film backwards. So for example, there's a kind of 
utopianism in running a film backwards. There's a perfection, a possibility of perfection. So for example, if you throw a glass of water across the surface, if you run the film backwards, you pick up and all the water comes back into your glass and it's spotless. There's a kind of cleanness and a, and a repair of the world. You take a piece of paper and tear it. In the real world, you can never make a perfect repair. When you run the film backwards, the paper repairs itself perfectly. So there's an image of a perfectible world in it, which is a kind of utopian thinking. Obviously, the, the, the first talking about shadows and shadows as a system of giving information comes very early on in Western philosophy with uh, Plato and his metaphor of the cave and people understanding the world imperfectly and going out into the sun and understanding it perfectly. And that's where the whole metaphor of light and knowledge come together. So it's, it refers back to that ancient history and a lot of the projects like the black box on the exhibition very much are about the limits of the enlightenment and the costs of the enlightenment. Well in the in Plato's metaphor, in Plato's cave, it had to do with taking people even unwillingly out of darkness into light. And so one of the elements of Plato's allegory has to do with knowledge and violence. And he puts the two together, that you may have to use violence to teach people truth. And that's a very dangerous lesson. And that's proved to be a very dangerous lesson. Every terrible tyrant in the world has assumed that they have good knowledge, but because they also have violence, the use of violence or power, they can do what they like to bring people into their idea of their knowledge. And this combination of knowledge and authority is always a dangerous one. Violence is always caused by people who have a certainty of their own knowledge. So when you think of Europe going into Africa or into North and South America, different colonial, the big colonial journey, it was always with a certainty either of their God or of their understanding of the world in terms of which they were able to justify whatever violence they wanted. So it's a mixture always of ideas and economics that go together. And violence is the way that it gets enforced. So it's not just about a clash of different ways of seeing the world, but the idea of the knowledge often justifies the violence to those using the violence. Knowledge has extraordinary power when it's used as a vulnerability, when one is vulnerable with the power. And the combination of knowledge and vulnerability seems to me the only hope to go forward. Knowledge and certainty always brings violence around it. Well, I think that there are different things that art can say about understanding and about meaning, more than maybe knowledge. But the main thing it does is it demonstrates to us the activity that we and the agency we have as viewers of art to construct the final work of art. If you're looking at a painting, you're looking at flecks of color, bits of abstract pieces of paint, which in your head you will construct into the horse, the landscape the heroic scene of soldiers and flags. And when you look at art, you're aware that you're not looking at reality, that you're translating fragments of different materials into an image of what the world could be in your head. And if we can understand this is the work we do, we understand there isn't something, knowledge that is outside of us that 
we're going to find and understand completely. But all we can hope to do is make richer and richer the sets of associations inside us to take these different fragments and construct different possible senses of ourself and the world. But it's always a provisional sense. It's never an absolute sense. I think that what I was, what I'm interested in demonstrating or making us aware of when we look at the, some of the very cut out paper pieces, the black shapes, is the need we have as human beings to make sense of the world. That whatever fragments we are given will try to construct a coherent sense of it. So there's a space, there's a time when these black shapes are just black shapes on a white piece of paper. But at a very early stage, as two of them fit together and you have four sticks coming down in the neck, you start seeing it as a horse. It's not that you interpret it as a horse, it's that your faculty of recognition tells you this is also a horse. So if we can understand what we do when we look at that picture and understand that's what we do when we look at the world the whole time, then that tells us a lot about how we construct knowledge, not just of pictures. So the picture becomes a demonstration of things beyond the picture. There are different ways in which politics comes into the world. Sometimes it comes in just like a diary. The events in South Africa that are happening over the months that I'm making the work become part of the raw material. So it can be private material, it can be things in the street, it can be things in the newspaper. So it works that way. That's the first way in which the political, of the political circumstances come into the work. And this, the second way in which the politics comes in is a larger polemic. And that has to do with understanding the world as provisional, the importance of uncertainty, and understanding the way in which we construct the world rather than simply find the world. I think it depends on the temperament of the artist. There's some artists who are very certain of their views in the world, and to make political art very kind of agitprop political art with great conviction, and there can be great art made that way. What's terrible is when you have people making that kind of political art without the conviction, in bad faith. Um, but I certainly think there are such interesting questions around politics in the world, of contradiction, of uncertainty, that it's a very rich field for all artists to come into contact with, to work with.